historical fiction is beautiful. We'll be talking more about it now. Dr. Champa, we, we will look at your insights into architecture. Yes, so how do I start? Maybe I start with Anirudh, and I will start with reading two passages from his book in his own words. This book is a story about this time when the Deccan ruled India, an epic journey through 500 years of a history that has long been forgotten. This book seeks to remedy this gap in our conception of our past because no story of these transformations that shook India and the world can be told without giving the medieval deck in the centrality it deserves. And this is the gist of the book. So this period between the Chalukyas to the Cholas is a rather dark spot in us. So we know of the Mughals, we know of the Deccani kingdoms, but this, this area is something that's a gap for us. Why, why, so two questions here. Why this gap? And why did you decide to kind of try to fill it? So, um, thanks for that, Adin. Um, I think the reason for the gap is, it's a little complicated. I don't think I can really sum it up in just a few sentences, but my sense at least is that in the, just imagine India in the 1950s, right? Less than a century before 1950, the subcontinent was a totally different land. It was made up of hundreds of principalities with vastly varying levels of education, vastly different levels of social justice, um, very different ideas of politics, of nationalism, even of religion. And yet somehow, from 1857 to 1947, this entire subcontinent, which keep in mind is larger than Western Europe, somehow begins to think of itself as a single political unity. And you begin to see this enormous landmass somehow emerges onto the global stage as a democracy with universal adult suffrage. We read that in our civics textbooks, but how many of us recognize what an extraordinary achievement it is for the time? When we're talking about many Western nations not allowing women to vote till the 1960s and 1970s, in India we had that in 1947 from the moment of independence. Now obviously, when such a diverse landmass begins to think of itself as a single country, you need to think of it as having a single history. And it seems to me, at least, going by textbooks, it seems that the inclination that the folks sitting in Delhi had was to emphasize what I call these ephemeral imperial moments, when you had a single polity that dominated large parts of India. And they also wanted such polities that were connected to modern day politics. So of course, polities that are based where the 1947 seat of power was, which is in Delhi. Um, so of course, when the textbooks are written, um, you emphasize first you know, the Mauryas, then you have the Guptas, you have all the great North Indian Gangetic empires, and then of course the Delhi Sultan and the Mughals and so on. Um, I understand that in the 1950s, I get that you want to create this historical concept of a unified territorial India. But why did the textbooks not change in the 1980s, 1990s? once we knew that there were all these amazing and fascinating and vibrant polities in southern India, the textbooks didn't change, the publishing industry didn't change. Um, and as to why I set out to try and correct that, um, I don't know how many of you all are from Bangalore. Uh, if, you're, if you've been to Bangalore recently, I don't know if you've been to Bookworm, uh, this magnificent bookstore on Church Street, right? Um, Bangalore, I think, in my opinion, is Bangalore's best bookstore. So I go there when I first moved to Bangalore for my first job, um, because I want to learn about the history of Karnataka, because since I moved there, it is now my home. And they didn't have a single book about it. And I was shocked. And through a series of rather audacious coincidences, which I don't have time to get into right now, um, I ended up deciding that, look, if Manu Pillai has written now about the Deccan Sultans, then slowly publishers are getting interested in the Deccan as a place that has its own history and that deserves to be read about. And I pitched them this idea for a book about the early medieval Deccan at a time that nobody knows about. Everybody's heard of the Guptas, everybody's heard of the Delhi Sultanate. Who knows what was happening in between? Can you imagine any other part of the world where for 500 years nobody knows what was happening? It's, it's, it's ridiculous that in 2022 this was the case. So I decided to, to write Lords of the Deccan. 
Great. Andrew, another question. Thank you. Thank you. So, you know, now in this new world of social media and everything is online and we have less time on our hands, you, you, you're basically competing with Netflix and stuff like that. So how do you, how did you write this? I mean, your honor or your, your book was not in competition with another writer because there was, there was none in popular history at least. So how did you, how did you make it in such a way that it is so popular today where even those who are not accustomed to reading books in the regular format started reading your book? So I think the, the biggest issue that is that when people think of history, they think of it as they're taught in school, right? And with all due respect to my history teachers who worked so hard, they didn't do a very good job. Um, <laughs> because history is reduced to nothing more than this dry procession of facts, right? Um, and even though that has begun to change in popular history, even in popular history, it's become about, oh, so there was this ruler, and instead of it being like school textbooks where, oh, you know, Emperor Ashoka built wells on his highways and he planted mango orchards and so on. Now it's become, oh, did you guys know that Emperor Ashoka had some really kinky fantasies in the bedroom, you know? Um, which is, it's just silly, you know? It, 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 it does not allow you to really develop a sense of these as complex and interesting people, just like you and me. Um, and that's really what I try to do in the book. Um, rather than trying to paint these figures as black and white heroes or villains, um, I try to paint them as people like us, who are, whose main objective uh, when they wake up is living to see the next sunrise. Um, because they're living in a brutal time. They are, these are people of war and violence, and they're also people of extraordinary culture and refinement. And to capture these many aspects of their personalities, to bring them and their world to life, and showing through a narrative format that history is not just a succession of individuals um, who bleed into one another and who are all the same, but rather people like you and me who are shaping the world that we live in today. Why does it matter for us to understand history? Because history shows us how our world became our world and how our world continues to change using very similar rules. And once you show people that history is important, not just from the perspective of hearing an interesting story about people like you and me, but also about understanding how our world transforms and continues to transform, that's when you get their attention. And of course, all the usual tricks that authors use, including violence and, um, like I said, kinky bedroom fantasies, all those are also there. But yeah, that's how it was. Thank you. Thanks. Which, <clears throat> Knights of the Moonless Sky, so the back, historical fiction. So this is a work of historical fiction. It's an oxymoron, right? How can fiction and history come together? What is historical fiction? I guess we have over a couple of hours for this, right? So not a problem. Uh, <laughs> so here's the thing. Well, first of all, the reason why all four of us are here is for a passion we all share about history. And we all strive to represent the truth. By the truth, I mean the capital T Wala truth. And to the best of our ability, following the conventions of the fields that we are interested in, architecture, narrative nonfiction, and the whiskey of my choice is fiction. And so, what exactly is historical fiction then? Uh, essentially, it's, it's a story that happened sometime in the past. The story is really, um, see, stories are what? They are hyper-realistic microcosms of everyday reality, right? I see the girl in front of uh, my house in um, Calcutta when I was in seventh grade. I'm still in love with her. And that must have been happening even back during the Janagara times, right? So, I love telling stories. Now, if you take, the, you know, this thing in behind us, it's a tapestry. So, if I put the tapestry as Vijayanagara Empire, and then I'll play out these interesting melodramas in front of it, you learn about history. History tells you what happened. Historical fiction tells you how they felt. Goes back and you sort of ponder about, gee, how the hell did they build, build that Brihadeshwara temple? 
Nobody has written anything on that. It's just, it's, basically it is, you know what I mean, right? And there are two or three books from that. That's, that's available only in the gift store in Briyadeshwara Temple, not anywhere else. So I was always interested in historical fiction. It's something that happened a long time ago. Some of them have real events with fictional people. Some of them have fictional people, you know, and real events. And, and, and then there's combination. Most interesting is real people and real events. All of you know about a famous actress called Hedy Lamar in Hollywood in the 30s. Everybody knows her, and nobody knew, nobody knows that she was a scientist who did research in Austria on Bluetooth technology. I mean, Wi-Fi technology, way back. Uh, today's uh, work is more or less derived from many other things. But she, then she went away and um, became a famous movie star. There's a great book on that, right? A Woman on Her Own or something like that. Uh, so historical fiction is my, my, my whiskey. I like to tell stories. Um, and I like these, uh, you know, a famous, famous historical fiction include Tale of Two Cities and, you know, that whole thing. Almost anybody here probably has heard of all of those and read them. So I like opening lines and last lines of uh, books. Every time I read a book, I write the first line, any book, and I write the last line. And I realized that most of these, my favorite first lines and last lines are from historical fiction. It was the best of times or the worst of times. It's a far, far better thing I do than I've ever done before. Right? Tomorrow is another day. <laughs> and so on. So I sat back and said, yaar, humko ek likhna hai sa. <laughs> So I started, uh, you know, researching history. By the way, when I came to Mysore, I had zero idea about what Vijayanagara Empire is. I went to the um, palace here. I was a newcomer, never been here 10 years ago. And then I go to the palace, and the guide, of course, uh, showed all the things. I said, hey, they, look at these corridors, right? There's got to be a story in which a princess is running down the corridor with a thing flaying. So he says, no, 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 people are very decent here. <laughs> no problem. That, this was one interesting story. So I started peeling this onion. I said, what is this Wadiyar family? She's not here, no? <laughs> uh, so uh, what happens? What is this Wadiyar family? So the guy, so he says, then I found out. Then I ran into three or four unbelievable people in Mysore. All of these are historians, Madhavan, Sheikh Ali, Narsim Murthy, et cetera. And they said, Vishwanath, these are the four books you need to read, and you will know more about Vijayanagara. And that's how it started. Not available in books, so you have to go at... That's how I started, and then before you know it, I am now up to about over 100 books I've read on this matter, including handwritten PhD theses from... You have done all of this, I'm sure. So I'm very blessed. I like historical fiction. Vijayanagara Empire, of course, I can take a story like Tale of Two Cities and put it in Vijayanagara Empire, right? Easily. So. That's how my journey in historical fiction is. That's part A of my answer. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I think this reminds me of Girish Karnad. So, you know, when he was asked about his play Tughlaq, and so somebody asked him, how many books did you read? And he said he read a lot of them, but suddenly he stopped because he felt he could not read everything. And he decided, I must start writing. So. I think that's, that's the stage. So you cannot read everything. You, you need to come, even any budding writers out there, you need to stop and you need to start. So when you start, I believe ideas flow in. Thank you. Dr. Jampa, so from an architect's perspective, and you also have an idea of classical architecture, so you, you also teach. So students, so, you know, when we think of history, all of us, even when we were young, before even we had read a book of history, we look at forts, we look at palaces, and that is where the conception of history and kings and empires comes in. So how much of architecture today, especially in colleges, or students are exposed in subjects to classical architecture, to, to Vijayanagara buildings, or, that is in subjects or in curriculum? So is that a part of it? Uh, thank you. Uh, yes. As 
Kanishati mentioned it's a narrative. So now architecture is all about perception and the movement and the journey. One cannot miss it, be it be any age, educated, uneducated, or whatsoever. I think it's a marvelous profession, but one need not be an architect to enjoy this particular historical journey which is there right in front of us, okay? And just to tell you, Vijayanagara, though many of you might have visited, every time you visit Vijayanagara, it has a different story to tell you. Because in your two days or three days of travel, you might want to explore something new, okay? So it's become an UNESCO heritage site too which is a very proud uh, thing for Karnataka. But at the same time, who did this is very, very important. To your answer to your question, you said, how is this taught? I think one, as he said, how our history teachers taught is, yes, a typical one. But then we rather go there in person. And the storytelling, the literature, what non-fiction or the fiction stories, what y'all are talking about, in a uh, black and white. So there we make it colorful going to the spot. That is where the architecture stays imprint in everybody's mind. That is what I would say. And as curriculum, if you may ask, yes, whether be it modern architecture or classical architecture, everything is a journey, as I mentioned. So there is always looking back to what uh, uh, the Maharajas or any other royal listing who have come about creating these settlements, it could be, or an individual building. It is always looked at. Thank you. Anirudh, what was the Deccan like when the Chalukyas, that's where our story starts? came to power, you know. So they came from the word chalke, which is a crowbar. So how did a crowbar welding family of husbandmen, farmers, in what circumstances did they come up and start an empire? You're asking me to summarize my whole book, uh, then. <laughs> but uh, um, the, the circumstances, you know, what, what was Deccan when they came? What was happening there? So. Um, we take for granted today that India has cities, that a significant proportion of India's population lives in cities, that roads exist, that temples exist. All these things are what we think of as India. But in the 500s uh, CE, that was not the case at all. You would not have seen an awful lot of temples. In fact, they would have, where they existed, they were mostly made of terracotta. There were a few major ones in northern India, but really not a lot in southern India, especially not a lot in North Karnataka. Um, it was not as much of an urbanized time. Um, most of the population lived um, out um, in the countryside. And agrarianism was also not a thing, uh, at least not to the extent it is today. Most people were pastoralists. They would have had uh, herds of sheep and goats and would have moved according to the seasons and so on. And the impetus for change happens because sometime around the fourth century, um, there are, there's this cultural complex, cultural and political complex that begins to emerge first in the Gangetic Plains. And then within a few decades, we see it spreading into Tamil Nadu, into South Karnataka, and all the way into Southeast Asia as well. Um, so this cultural complex is what is called by some scholars as a Sanskrit cosmopolis. So this idea emerges that Sanskrit can and should be used in political contexts. So royals begin to use Sanskrit in these long prashastis describing their power. Um, you begin to see kavyas and dramas being composed, especially by Kalidasa, who of course I'm sure a lot of us have heard of. Um, and you also begin to see these very new and interesting interpretations of Hinduism. Uh, which you call Puranic or temple-based Hinduism. So this idea is that rather than centering Hinduism around the Vedic sacrifice, that it's centered around these more permanent temple-based institutions. And of course, there were shrines and all earlier, but from the fourth century onwards, the pace of it and the scale of it begins to accelerate. And 
there is very rapid realization by ruling elites across the subcontinent that this is a great way for us to create kingdoms and to institutionalize power and to transmit it from father to son to generate wealth, to generate manpower, to go to war, um, and to build monuments that stand the test of time. Um, and it's from those early beginnings that we see in this huge stretch of land, not just in the Deccan, but all the way into Tamil Nadu, and as I said, stretching into Southeast Asia, you begin to see temples emerging. Uh, you begin to see merchants and monks moving at unprecedented scales. And of course, you begin to see war happening uh, in a way that it has never happened before. You begin to see these inscriptions talking about, uh, I don't know if I will be censored for saying this, but intestines pouring out of bellies and uh, blood spilling from spearheads, cities being burned down, all this kind of violence, right? But this violence is what also creates a political economy that allows wealth to be concentrated, that allows cities to be built, that allows temples to be built. And when we see these, very often we think of them as things to be proud of, and certainly they are. These are remarkable cultural achievements. But it's also important to recognize that the political economy that produced it is very different from the way that we think about our world today. Um, so that's really where it begins, and that's very much the, the world that across centuries and centuries produces the architecture that you, of course, uh, write about, Professor, and um, eventually leads to the Vijayanagara state that you've written about, Kush. Thank you. Now that you mentioned wars, so, you know, after reading this, something that really struck my mind, so, especially in these days when history is being examined again, rewritten, erased, all over the world, also here, you know, we, we often have this feeling that it was only after the coming of the Turks and after the 11th century where we had violent wars and pillages and vandalism and mass murders that happened during wars. But I'll just give you some texts here. And you've done a fabulous job of going through epigraphical evidences, archaeological evidences, oral history, uh, inscriptions on stone. And each of this is so well documented. So I'll just read some texts. In 674, Vikramaditya finally decided his time had come and led a marauding Deccan army once more into Tamilagam. Over the next few years, he set out to brutally avenge Narasimha's conquest of Watapi, that's Badami. And remember that Badami was burnt to the ground by the Pallavas, claiming for himself the title of Ranarasika, lustful for battle, and Rajamalla, wrestler of kings, because he had destroyed the family of the Mahamalla, which was Narasimha Pallava. There's another thing. So there are several of these things. And there's another thing of, you know, when they defeat the Chalu, the Ch I do not know if anyone, if people are aware that the Chalukyas had the prestige of defeating the first Arab incursion into India. So the first Arab incursion of India happened in Sindh, we know. But there was this large gap of over 300 years from when the Ghaznavids came in through Kabul. But in, the 700, in 767, 737, this was the time when Charles Mackle was hammering the Arabs at the gates of Sicily and the Moroccans, the Moors, had gone into Spain. So this was the time of the great expansion of Islam, which happened in a period of about 50 years. This time, there are Tajiks, that is again, Islamic tribes of Central Asia. For the first time, they crossed over and came down at the Deccan, and they were beaten by the Chalukyas. So essentially, 300 years of uh, what would have been Islamic history was postponed there. And, and this is a very good description of that. Pulakeshi Raja praises the Tajikas as those who had not previously been vanquished even by numerous eminent chiefs among hosts of kings. Says they were great warriors and had their sharp swords reddened by the blood flowing from the torn loins and trunks of hostile elephants. And describes a great cloud of dust rising towards the skies as the Arab horses galloped. But after hours of brutal slaughter, the legendary Deccani infantry finally bested their enemies, their armor reddened by the streams of blood, gushing from intestines, spilling out of bellies impaled by spearheads. So the point I want to make is all of us, a lot of us, have an idea of wars being violent. And it was General Grant in the American Civil War who said, you know, war is hell. So war has been hell, not just in the last thousand years, but it has been hell even the time of the old, you know, the so-called golden age of 
uh, when only the Hindus were here. So you have read so much. I mean, this, don't you think that this has been downplayed over time, that a lot of us are not aware that as much blood has been shelled or was spilled over the past thousand years, maybe more was spilled among Indian kings in the years before that? That's a very good question, Nidin. And I think, yes, absolutely. Um, if I think it is a very good thing that kings are being criticized for the role they played in unleashing this kind of violence at like, and it's horrifying. So all, all these descriptions of, uh, you know, blood flowing from elephant loins and torn bellies and all that, I didn't make that up. It's from Polakeshi Raja's actual inscription. Um, and there's many, many more examples of this through the book. I specify which epigraphic volume you can look them up in, which verse number, you can check them out yourselves. Um, and I think it is a good thing that, for example, Mahmoud of Ghazni or Alauddin Khilji, all these guys are being criticized for the kind of violence they unleashed. Um, but why do we assume that that was something that was limited only to a particular kind of king or to a particular kind of religion? It is the nature of political power to be violent. Um, and if you studied sociology, uh, we'll know the famous Weberian definition of the state is that it's an entity that monopolizes the use of physical force in any given territory. Why do we think that any state at any point of time did not do the exact same thing? And if anything, medieval states didn't have the ability, like modern states, to monopolize violence. So everybody and their grandma could be violent. And that's exactly what we see in the inscriptions. You will see all these like petty, like, and there's not just kings, but also like these petty queens, you know, like the, the, who come from these royal families and rule over like, like a half dozen villages and they are described as a Bhairavi in battle whose feet has been reddened by the blood of hostile kings and that kind of thing. Um, so it's a time of profound violence. And again, it is not limited to or driven by religion. Everybody uses religion to justify the violence. So you will see these kings saying that, oh, yeah, I, I, I churned all these kings in the, in the mortar of my prowess uh, and I established dharma on the earth. And like you read that and it's, to me, at least, it's, it's quite disturbing. It almost makes my skin crawl that you, you claim that this kind of violence and this kind of murder is what establishes order on the earth. And that kind of hypocrisy is universal to political power. You will see it in, in Egypt, you know, uh, where the pharaohs, after like slaughtering brutally enemy armies, will be like, oh, yes, I have established order on the earth. You see it happening in Mesopotamia, the earliest states. You will see these murals of Assyrian kings you know, beheading their enemies, killing lions with their bare hands and being like, oh, yes, I've established order on the earth. And all the way up to the present day, through independence and after, every political party, after unleashing the cops on any peaceful protest, would be like, yes, we have restored law and order. Um, so that is the nature of political power. It's, uh, thank you. Wish, uh, this is for you. Historical fiction. So how is it different from WhatsApp history? How is it different from WhatsApp history? I mean, there is history there. And it's fiction. A lot of us know it's fiction. So how is any, any, any book? I, I do not point to your book alone. How is that genre different from that? Well, <laughs> what's up? Um, let me put it this way. Tale of Two Cities is not just about history. Well, you don't learn about the French Revolution by just reading Tale of Two Cities. Right? You, you look at it, then there's the story of redemption, of self-sacrifice, and stuff like that. Right? Each genre has its convention. I can rate, write Tale of Two Cities as a horror story and, and, and do it slightly differently. So in this way, there's a lot of thought that goes in that after you're done reading the book, the reader must sit back and think about what the hell happened here, right? Uh, as, as a right, this is just from a reader's point of view, from a writer's point of view. Let me tell you, you talk about, um, you know, the history, like narrative, nonfiction history, you, you collect facts and then you write it in a nice way and then you write brilliantly. Okay, so, um, I, as a, as a fiction writer, I go start looking for, uh, I do research, by the way, on what the, what did she eat that morning? Right, Vijayanagara, you're in the middle of somewhere. Uh, and uh, so I ask people, 
give you an example. Two, you talk about violence, right? And we know Bollywood has figured this out, that sex and violence, the number one and number two things that make the world tick, right? So in my book, there's a character, and she's in my, one of the drafts. She's going to have, she gets the, no kids here, right? So she gets the hearts for her husband's bodyguard. So my question was, and she wants to have an affair with him. So this is the plot line, right? I mean, remember, I watch Hindi movies, so I got a lot of plot lines here. <laughs> so I'm sitting here and going, how would she go about doing this? Because it is not like she can call an auto and go there and meet him in Chalo and Park. <laughs> so I started researching. You, you, trust me, nobody's done a PhD on this matter. So I went to a very eminent historian, and it just so happened to be a woman, and who had done a lot of work, and she understands Vijayanagara inside out. So I asked her, so, so, so she was very nice, and I was a nice guy, I wore a nice shirt. And then I went there, and I sit there and say, I got this situation, tell me what, how would I do? I said, this is a woman, a Brahmin woman, and she is going to have, wants to have an affair with her husband's uh, bodyguard, who happens to be Muslim, by the way. And this is 16th century, the year is 1542. How would she go about it? How will, she, he, this guy cannot enter their house or, or their plan. Uh, there are a lot of logistic issues, right? She looked at me like I was from Mars. <laughs> and she says, no, in those days, they never used to do such things. <laughs> I said, really? This is good. So that became, that gave me a storyline and a plot line. Imagine, so typically in any story, there's an inciting incident that moves the story along. Then there's progressive complications, you know, Saas jag rahi hai, nana jag rahi hai, whatever be the case, right? <laughs> and then there's a crisis question, should I take the risk and just do this or not? And then there's a resolution, man kata hai ki nahi karna hai, pyaar kya to darna kya. And then there's a climax in which either she's caught or she's not caught. <laughs> so, Talking about, your question of course is, what, what are the problems of fiction writing and historical different from WhatsApp? In WhatsApp, all I have to do is good morning. And then that picks up the trend. Uh, by the way, I'm an admin for one of the groups, <laughs> WhatsApp groups, and we don't allow politics and religion. And now I'll have to throw in sex and violence too. <laughs> but that is history, it's, it, it's not easy. Uh, I just want to pick one thing about, you know, you talked about the architecture part. I swear, if you're willing to work with me, I'll work with you on this. Somebody should write, uh, there is a book called Pillars of the Earth. Uh, you've heard of it. It, it, it's by Ken Follett. It is brilliant, right? Uh, 30 years after it was written, it still sells 40,000 copies a month. I don't think I'm going to sell 40,000 or anything in my life. Okay, so now, why that story is about the building of a cathedral? It's like getting an architecture lesson about building of cathedrals, right? And it talks about uh, there's history and there's real people. Thomas Beckett. Those of you who are old like me, uh, no, send the movie Beckett, right? Thomas, you know that famous scene. So the Thomas Beckett um, is a character in that, and there's melodramas. So there's history, there's fiction, there's architecture. Why hasn't anybody written a single book about the building of Brihadeshwara temple? Or pick any temple, right? But I just picked up Brihadeshwara because when you go to that place, it knocks your socks off. You know, when I first came here, I did, I did the Indian American thing, which is you take a taxi and six or seven of your relatives and 
everybody goes in two days they will see humpy chalukya baidami halwa whatever right all these things and they'll come back me i hole ho gaye dia i said i spent two weeks just in hospital just every and aliye ni the so this is the problem so if both of you can collaborate with me i am in if 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 i could just leap in here so yeah, please please oh, um, i by the way my wife has told me very clearly don't ramble don't ramble <laughs> so, so i'll stop uh, rambling so I, i will take up the baton of rambling okay. from here on um <laughs> So I Thank think you. That's, that's, that's a very interesting question. The question of why is there no historical fiction about this kind of thing? And I think part of it is because compared to European history, right, the research material is not there. It is very difficult to read a book about the Cholas that isn't just, oh, Raja Raja Cholan was so great, and then Raja Indra Cholan was so great. And the historiography that is available to most people does not allow the capacity for writing. of historical characters as interesting individuals right because of our need to reduce them into these very bland sanskari characters who who did not have affairs huh? who did not run dramatically down corridors with their flying saris right B- because we project this this very restrictive victorian morality onto indian historical figures who lived mind you in a very very different moral world it's very difficult for people to imagine and write this kind of thing then if they do write it i can imagine that there would be some furor from the powers that be um so that's part of the answer to your to your question <laughs> dr champa yeah uh just to continue what wish asked as i mentioned i think architecture is literature and literature is architecture that means you have things to be seen and understood now if i just recollect somebody did mention i hole patitkal we are very proud again karnataka i mean i hole patitkal those who have been it sort of talks about the entire architectural history where the temple architecture just to tell you all both dravidian style which we have seen in south india as well as the north indian style the vasnagara style both have been initiated or sort of started in patitkal and aihole okay so you they both are standing next to each other and talking a different historical movement over there and there have been many many stories in terms of artists or the kings who really encourage because of the power that they he had it okay and as they mention it in their literature when they have the peaceful or the solid security entrusted on these royal kingdoms that is when the kingdom prospers and they do give due diligence towards other kind of development so that we can see it in karnataka now moving back from vijayanagar which is the sort of in the development of uh, architectural history or temple architecture that's sort of the last of the indian architecture so coming to odaya okay because vijayanagar and wadia uh, is associated now within mysore itself how many of you have don't feel the minute you come into mysore wow mysore bandvi appa namor ek bandvi the whole idea so the thanks to the mysore maharaja nalvedi krishna raja wadiyar during the, his 30 to 40 years of reign but we cannot forget it is not only their vision but because they traveled a lot and there was also britishers who were there okay so now the particular journey if we look at it it's the reba the british whatever the architecture comes also into that but then we have not lost our vernacular or historical such style even in mysore we are all there looking at it each one of our day over here that is what i want to just add and thank you so much we would definitely uh, be happy to work with you for all the other things yeah i think i am being pushed from the right and the left too and but that's okay so i i there's just a 
a small a final question uh, uh, to you and you how so you know this was also a time when Jainism and Buddhism were being displaced and moved out so what was the role of this particular period wherein these two old faiths started decreasing patronage was of course one part but how how did this really aid in the diminishing of these th so in the Deccan at least uh, yes Buddhism loses its uh, primary place but Jainism powers to a dominance alongside Shaivism and it continues to be a very important religion in Karnataka till at least 1500 as far as I know and perhaps wish you can you can with what you know Vijayanagar I can actually provide a precise date for that um, one of the most interesting inscriptions that I read in my entire research for the book um, was of the this epitaph of the Ganga King Marasimha the uh, third and you can actually see that at uh, that epitaph at Shravana Belgola today and it goes something on the lines of uh, oh, uh, Pallava king, you know, you can stop worrying. Oh, Chola king, you can stop rubbing your palpitating heart and you can calm down. And Pandya king, you don't need to run away anymore because the great Ganga chieftain Marasimha has gone in peace to the abode of the gods. Um, and the, 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 the rest of the inscription describes how Marasimha, you know, he destroyed the citadel of Uchangi and like with a great slaughter, this is a term that his poet uses. He talks about how uh, Marasimha had like a pyramid of skulls of his enemies that he would leave wherever he went and all these, all these beautiful and very violent and gory things. And you know how Marasimha's life ended? You know how he went to the abode of the gods? He gave away his kingdom to his sons, uh, took on the robes of a Jain monk after doing all that violence, he's a Jain, he goes to Bankapur, he sits at the feet of his guru Ajita Sena and he stars himself to death. So all this violence was being done by a Jain king, <laughs> right? And this is one example, there's so many other Jain kings who do this. Was there a, last, was there a golden age ever in India? And for whom? I mean, if ever was a gold, I mean, for the kings, I'm sure it was a golden age. <laughs> 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 Yeah. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> <laughs> one last closing. When I wrote my book, it's a historical thriller. The advantage of see, I don't want to push push the book here. I just use the general concept. And when I wrote that, it, people read thrillers because they want to enjoy the thrill without the risk. Number one. Number two, I wanted to showcase a broken woman who has to reinvent herself. And we all know there is nothing stronger than a broken woman who has rebuilt herself. No question about it. And I wanted to do this. So I don't know if this answers your question about Jainism, but I don't think so. But the uh, fact is that, you know, that motivate, that, that plot line to me just became great. So I think we're getting the hook here. So thank you very much, all, all of you. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. So the Cheras, the Pandavas, the Cholas, everybody, Maharajas, Maharanis, and what a wonderful trip down the beautiful history lane this one hour has been. I'm sure you all will agree that this past hour has been absolutely scintillating. Thank you so much. And uh, Dr. Vishwanath here, which as we all very fondly know, said all the panelists here did share a passion for history. And true, you guys have shared this passion with all of us and thank you for that. And a small request to the audience, books are all sold outside at the launch there. Please purchase them and stand in a queue.